Welcome to Future Talk. On today's program, we're going to talk about earthquakes. Earthquakes have been very much in the news lately, especially with the recent 9.0 earthquake in Japan. And a lot of places in the United States, especially on the West Coast, are also vulnerable to quakes. We're going to talk about the science of earth movements, new advances in predicting quakes, methods of preparing for quakes, and ways of responding to them. I have two guests. In the second half of the show, I'll be speaking with Kevin Montgomery, CEO of IntelliSense Technologies, which provides a global integrated monitoring service for managing all kinds of disasters, including earthquakes. But first, I'll be speaking with Gene Hardebeck, a research geophysicist on the earthquake hazards team at the U.S. Geological Survey. Jean Hardebeck has a Ph.D. in geophysics from Caltech, and her awards include the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers, the James B. McElwain Medal from the American Geophysical Union, and the Charles F. Richter Early Career Award from the Seismological Society of America. Jean, welcome to the program. Good Thank to have you today. Thank you very much. Now, what do we actually know about the cause of earthquakes? I understand that it has something to do with tectonic plates. What are they exactly? That's correct. So we usually think of the Earth as being made up of hard rock. And that's true of the outer part of the Earth, which we call the lithosphere, or the rock part of the Earth. And that part of the Earth is actually floating on top of rock that flows like very slow molasses. And it's this lithosphere, this um, hard rock part of the Earth, that is divided up into a number of plates. For instance, North America is a plate. The Pacific Ocean is a plate. And where these plates move past each other as they float on this sort of slow molasses rock is where we tend to have a lot of earthquakes. And the recent earthquake in Japan occurred because the Pacific plate is diving down under the islands of Japan. Now, if the Earth is covered with a solid crust, how does it get broken up into separate pieces? And why aren't all of these tectonic plates moving in unison over this soupy stuff below the surface? So this, the soupy stuff below the surface is actually very hot, and there's heat trying to escape from the Earth. And this heat then causes upwellings, which push these plates apart away from each other. And then we end up with places um, for instance, in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, where new, new crust, new lithosphere is being created. So in places like Iceland, for instance, where there's a lot of volcanoes, those volcanoes are making the new crust and pushing those two plates away from each other. So if two plates move away from each other, the molten material between them will cool off with exposure right. to air. Right, right. And so there's, um, that's one of the forces driving the plates. And the other force driving the plates is eventually these plates cool. And the, and the cooling plates are heavy and descend down back into the earth. So that's what's actually happening under Japan, that this thick, cold Pacific plate is diving down under Japan because it's cold and dense and falling towards the center of the earth. Now, if the tectonic plates meet at the edges going in opposite directions, does that mean that if you live in the middle of a tectonic plate, which might be 5,000 miles in diameter, you're relatively safe. Is it only at the edges of the plates where there's an earthquake danger? Um, the, most of the earthquake danger is concentrated near the plates, but there are actually large earthquakes that occur inside the plates. And a famous example of that are the New Madrid earthquakes that occurred near Memphis, Tennessee in um, 1811 and 1812. And these were very large earthquakes that were very dest destructive and felt over much of the east coast of the United States. Now, how solid are these plates? Are they pretty cohesive, or are they just you know, riddled with faults all the way through, not just at the edge? Um, they're, they're fairly cohesive, but there are faults um, within the interiors of these plates as well. Now, there was recently this huge earth earthquake in Japan. It killed many thousands of people, 9.0 on the Richter scale. And a lot of people who live in California want to know, what's the chance that we would have a comparable earthquake here? So um, in the northernmost California, from about Mendocino north up through Oregon, Washington, and into British Columbia, is a subduction zone pretty much just like the subduction zone in Japan. And in our case, um, this is a remnant of another, another plate next to the Pacific plate that's diving down now under North America. 
And we have actually had an earthquake very similar to what just occurred in Japan in the year 1700. So um, that earthquake we actually know a lot about because it caused also a large tsunami over the Pacific Ocean and was recorded in Japan. I think we actually have some slides which illustrate uh, what California looks like from an earthquake perspective. So maybe we'll take a look. Okay, so there's the first, what well, was there? Uh, can we see that first slide again? There it is. So what is that slide telling us exactly? So this is a map where we are looking at the probability of a magnitude 6.7 or greater earthquake in California. And a magnitude 6.7 is about the same size as the 1994 Northridge earthquake in LA, or a little smaller than the Loma Prieta earthquake here. And you can see that the bright colors, the red colors, where we see the highest probability are mostly focused along the San Andreas Fault, along the coast of California, and a little bit on the eastern side of the Sierras. When you say there's a certain percentage likelihood of an earthquake in California, is there a distinction between northern or southern California? Because California is a large state. So, so this is what this map is meant to show, that the regions where you see the warmer colors are the regions where these earthquakes are more likely. So um, we think that there's actually pretty much a 99% probability that there'll be a magnitude 6.7 or greater earthquake in, somewhere in California over the next 30 years. But most of that likelihood is concentrated along this Cascadia subduction zone in northernmost California and along the San Andreas Fault system. Okay, let's take a look at the next slide. Uh, do we have another? Okay. So, so this, this so looks like the San Francisco Bay Area, more or less. Right. So this is focusing in on the San Francisco Bay Area. And we think that there's a 63% chance of a magnitude 6.7 or greater earthquake within the next 30 years. So I think of that as sort of the probability of um, a large earthquake in the Bay Area during the rest of my career as a seismologist. So looking a little bit at, that num at those numbers on the particular faults, you can see that the fault we're actually most worried about is the Hayward Fault in the East Bay. And when you say that there's this certain probability of having an earthquake of that magnitude, how much damage would an earthquake of that magnitude do? Because that's not nearly as big as the one they just had in Japan. Uh, you're right, it's not as big, but it would be even closer to where people are living. So, um, for example, there was recently a damaging earthquake in Christchurch, New Zealand that was about this size that happened to occur in the city of Christchurch and was quite damaging and killed a number of people. So I believe my third slide uh, is a comparison yeah, of... Yeah, there's the third slide. So the third slide is a comparison of the shake... On the left is the shaking that we experienced in the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake. For those of you who lived in the Bay Area back then, we all remember that that was quite a destructive earthquake, particularly in the Marina District. Um, and, but we can see here that most of the shaking in that earthquake was actually focused in Santa Cruz. On the right is a scenario of a similar sized earthquake occurring on the Hayward Fault. And you can see all of the bright colors, which are the heavy shaking, occur along the East Bay in these very heavily populated areas, such as Berkeley and Oakland, Fremont, um, and also down to San Jose. So, so this earthquake, a uh, same size earthquake, but on the Hayward Fault, could be actually much more destructive in the Bay Area than the Loma Prieta earthquake was. Are we pretty confident that we know where all the fault lines are, or could we be discovering new fault lines that we didn't know about? Um, we know where a, most of the largest faults are. Uh, we do discover new faults all the time. And sometimes we do discover them when they have an earthquake. The 1994 Northridge earthquake in LA area is an example of that. And we can also find them um, through various sorts of seismological studies and other sorts of geological studies. We can find these faults before they have a damaging earthquake. Okay. 